Lord. The Lord has been doing some great things in our midst this past week, over the last few weeks actually, and I'm glad to get in on it. I'm going to ask you to stand and let's sing a song we've been learning that talks about the great things the Lord has done.
you uh, are, are never going to clap. That's okay. Some of you are clapping. Some of you, you're not sure. You, you like this if you're looking around. I want you to know if you want to clap, let's clap our hands. All you people shout to God with a voice of triumph. Soon he's coming back to welcome me. Here we go.
feeling mighty fine after that, then we need to sing it again. <laughs> they said we was lucky to get it twice this morning. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning to worship, and uh, we've got several visitors with us, and we're glad that, that you are here. Um, you came with your, your families to, uh, to, to worship with us. If at some point during the service you could just take that card that's there in the seat in front of you, and fill that out. We would love to have a record of your attendance and pray for you this week. And uh, you might get a text or you might get a, a letter or an email from Brother Allen. Uh, but he would love just to pray for you this week. Um, and we're feeling fine, so we want you to feel fine. And if you will give him a card at the end of the service other than for you, he's got a special gift for you. Um, so if you could just take that opportunity and fill that out. And then at the end of the service, his wife, Miss Christie, and he will be out in the foyer. Uh, we want to continue to pray uh, for our country. We want to pray for uh, Israel, as we all know what's going on uh, there. Uh, we also want to pray for Brother Jerry. He's been uh, in a revival this weekend, so we pray that he has the, the strength to continue and uh, just preach the word uh, as we all know that he can. Could you pray with me? Lord, we just pause this morning. We just ask that your hands would be upon us, that you would come and that you would just uh, fill this space with your presence this morning. We pray uh, for Israel as they're going through uh, such difficulties with um, family members and uh, maybe they've lost family members or they're separated from family members. We pray that um, you would just guide and direct every step. Also, we pray that you would just do with our country and that you would guide the leaders and that the leadership would follow you. And we say, pray the same prayer for our church, that uh, you would just lead us in the direction you want us to go. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we make decisions for uh, daily occurrences, that you would just guide us and that we would uh, just feel your guidance and then we would follow it. Lord, I just pray for the continuation of this service and that you would just be here and that you would be with us and your presence would be felt. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
testify that God has been good to you. Let's just wave at you, will you? Amen. He's been good to me. You know this hymn? Oh, for a
My name is Moises Grossinger, and I'm from El Salvador. I actually don't know much about my own country uh, because I was in an orphanage on the river and that's where I grew up. Every Sunday after church service, it was family day for, for those who have parents. Every year, I waited and not having them visit me, so I always ask myself, if I wasn't good enough for my parents, would I ever be good enough for anyone else? So that day, when we were told there were going to be people coming to our homes to bring us gifts, and they kept repeating the phrase, Jesus loves you, uh, I started to walk away when a man motions me back and um, he, he tells me, where are you going? You don't have a shoebox yet. And I quickly replied, but I don't have any parents. And um, that's when he looked directly into my eyes and with a smile on his face, he just hands me the shoebox and he tells me, Jesus loves me. As I received that, I kept looking at it and I started to walk away. And I looked back to see if the man was going to come back and take the shoebox back. But he did, and he knew what I was thinking, so he just smiled and waited for everybody to have a moment to open the shoebox. That day was just full of joy. So my wow item was a, a soccer ball, and I couldn't believe it that it was mine, um, that I just remember opening it and receiving that soccer ball, and I just remember just playing in the orphanage. We had a big field to play on, and I just remember running with the soccer ball all, all over the orphanage. So it was that moment when I realized that I was loved and I was seen. With my shoebox, I also received the greatest gift booklet. And I, that's when my prayer journey began and I started to pray for a family. When I was 10 years old, I was called into the office of the orphanage and I was told that there was going to be a family in the United States who wanted to adopt me. And I was introduced to my adoptive family and I just remember running to them and calling them familia. Now I live my life saying yes to them because I have no reason to say no. He did not just give me a family, but he gave me a new life. Well, we have the great privilege to participate with churches, thousands of churches, as uh, we minister to children all around the world. Operation Christmas Child is what it's called, OCC. And you take a shoebox and you fill that shoebox with different items, small toys, hygiene items, that kind of thing. And then... Each shoe box will be filled, or, or within each shoe box will be placed a track where they can hear the gospel, read the gospel. I was thinking this morning, only eternity will tell all the children around the world that were saved as a result of the Operation Christmas Child. All the children that have been saved as a result of you uh, giving. There's two ways to do that. <clears throat> One is we have boxes out in the foyer. You can take as many as you want. You can buy the uh, items that you wish to buy. I think there are some suggestion lists inside the box that uh, if you're not used to packing a box, that will give you ideas of some things. You could go to the Dollar Tree or whatever, some, some store like that and get different uh, items and you can put that uh, in, in the box in the middle of November. We'll dedicate those boxes. Uh, we'll take them to a regional center and there uh, they will be joined with churches, from boxes from other churches all around our country and they will be shipped and these uh, uh, children will be able to receive a Christmas present that uh, they wouldn't get otherwise. You can also uh, give money if you don't have the time or you're not sure what to purchase. If you would like to give to buy some boxes, uh, we've got uh, people that will go and purchase the items and, uh, and that kind of thing. So some of you like to do that. If that's you, uh, I would just encourage you to uh, write a check to the church, write it to Riverview, and memo it, uh, Operation Christmas Child, or OCC, and that will get uh, to the right place, and uh, we've got some folks that will go and purchase the items for you. So you've got a few weeks, and you can choose to do what you want. I'm going to ask, how much does it cost to fill a box? Approximately 20 
to $25 uh, with the shipping. <clears throat> and so uh, that you kind of get that in your mind. And uh, the middle of November, we'll have boxes everywhere across this platform and we'll have a special prayer time as we dedicate these boxes. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool for them to receive some small toys, even things we take for granted like hygiene items and that kind of thing. But the most important thing is each box is going to contain the gospel and someone is going to share the gospel with those boys and girls all around the world and share with them that God loves them. Jesus died for their sins. He rose again from the dead. And when they call out to Him, they can have everlasting life. What an opportunity to share the gospel in places we'll never get to. And so, speaking of the gospel, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans, the New Testament book of Romans. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 3. Three. <clears throat> Today, I want to talk to you about this subject, seven great gospel words. Seven great gospel words from Romans chapter 3. Now, I know Baptists. I don't know a lot of things, but I know Baptist people. So I just want to tell you, I'm keenly aware of the time. And we will not get through with all seven points this morning. This will be a two-week message. I just want to set some of you at ease. You're thinking, is he going to cover seven points? Now, I wouldn't embarrass anybody that would think that, Jimmy Dean Smith. <coughs> but uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I promise, this will be a two-week message. But I've been so excited to preach this seven great gospel words from Romans chapter 3. The book of Romans is a gospel book. It's about the gospel. The word gospel, if you don't know what it means, it simply means this, good news. Good news. We're to proclaim the good news. We're to proclaim that news which is good. Now, many of us proclaim news that's not so good. If we're going to talk about something uh, relevant, a lot of times because we live in a bad news society, that's all we know to talk about is the bad news going around. Well, I want to tell you, when you talk about the gospel, you're not talking about bad news. You're talking about good news. The good news of the gospel. We are to proclaim the good news. In fact, Paul says in the first chapter of Romans, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Riverview, that is my prayer. That we'll never, ever be ashamed of the gospel. The good news that Jesus left the, the perfection of heaven. And he came to this sin-filled world. And he lived a perfect life. <clears throat> and because he was perfect, he died on a horrible, a bloody, rugged cross for my sin, my imperfection. And he rose from the dead. And he's coming back again. Friend, that is the gospel. And the book of Romans is a theological book. It contains the gospel. And in Romans chapter 3, over the next two weeks, I want to give you seven great gospel words from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. All right? I'm going to ask you to look at Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. But now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. <clears throat> Lord, uh, we're not dealing with a, a, a passage that is what you would consider milk. We're dealing with the meat of the word today. God, I pray that you'll give us understanding, clarity. Lord, I pray for every Christian in the room that you would remind us of the glorious gospel of Jesus that has changed our life. And Lord, for those in the room who are not saved, they're, they're, they don't have a relationship with you. They're not sure if they were to die today, if they would go to heaven. Lord, I pray today that they would call out to you and be saved. Lord, speak now, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The third chapter of Romans digs into our need for the gospel. But I can think of no greater verse that encapsulates the gospel like John 3, 16. Many of you can close your eyes and quote this verse, but I want us to quote it together. It's going to be on the screen. Would you say it with me? Here we go. For God so loved the world that He gave <clears throat> That verse encapsulates the, the gospel. But in Romans chapter 3, we are digging deep into the gospel. And I want to try to flesh, uh, to flesh out the gospel uh, for you this morning from this text. I, I, I want us to talk about some great gospel words and then... I'm going to give a gospel invitation for you to come and receive the gospel. Receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. The first word, when we talk about the gospel, according to Romans 3, the first great gospel word I want you to see is this. Sin. Sin. <clears throat> verse 23, we, we know the verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin. The word sin means to miss the mark. <clears throat> to miss the mark. Within the last week or two, we talked about shooting arrows. Suppose that we had a dartboard up here. And I had some darts and I called some of you to the platform to throw the darts. The object of the game is to hit the bullseye. If you hit the bullseye, that is a perfect throw. You have hit the mark perfectly. If you don't hit the bullseye, you have not hit the mark perfectly. You have missed the mark. And let me say, that if I threw a dart and it was way over here as far as you could go from the bullseye, I would have missed the mark. But let's just say Randy King comes to the platform, he throws the dart. He doesn't hit the bullseye, but he gets right under the bullseye. He still missed the mark. So it does not matter how close or how far away you are, you still miss the mark. 
I, I, I want us to look at, and you're in Romans 3, back up to verses 10 through 12. Verses 10 through 12. As it is written, <clears throat> there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now I want to ask you some questions. And this is not a rhetorical question. I need participation. I need participation. You ready? Here's the first question. How many are righteous? None. How, how many understand? How many seek after God? How many do good? And he says this, not even one. Not even one. You see, friend, it doesn't matter how close you get to the bullseye, to perfection, we're still going to miss the mark. And if you miss the mark, it means that you're a sinner. And guess what? Every man born of woman is a sinner except the Lord Jesus Christ because He's the God-man. He's the God-man. <coughs> now, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Well, I, I, it, I can sum it up like this. Perfection. Perfection. The glory of God. Perfection. And Paul said, not only are we sinners, we've missed the mark. But we fall short of the glory of God. Now, <clears throat> let's just suppose. Now, you can't see this back here. But there's a line in this concrete. I don't know if it goes all the way back or not. But there's a line right here. And there's a line in the concrete right here. Again, I'm not sure if it goes all the way back or not. But there's two lines. Let's just say, let, let's just say that this is the line that means perfection. This is where God is. This is, this is where God is. He dwells here. Now, I just chose this side. Uh, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're heathens and these are the righteous folk. I just chose this side. In fact, looking at some of you, I should have gone to the other side. <laughs> This is perfection. All right? Now, let's just say I'm going to give you a running start. We'll open those double doors. In fact, we'll open the doors outside. If you want to start outside and you take off running, but you've got to jump from this line and get to the other line, I would dare say very few, if any, could get from this line to the line of perfection. You and I will fall short. Now, the most athletic person in the room is not me. I don't know who it is, but it's not me. But it doesn't matter how hard you try and you're running and you're running and you're going to jump and you're going to try to reach the mark of perfection, we're all going to come close. Now again, let me remind you, if my singing buddy Jerry Carr and I were in a contest and we were running and we were jumping, I'm going to take off and I'm going to try to get all of this up in the air and I might could jump here. I land here. But Jerry, he's younger than me. He's in better shape than me. He takes off running. And let's just say Jerry winds up here. There's the line. So does it really matter if he's here and I'm here? You see, some people look at sin as big sin, little sin. Now, there are consequences to sin. If I lie to you, 
I'm going to suffer the consequence. But the consequence is not as um, bad as if I murdered you. That's serious consequence. You see, the consequences to sin are different. But sin is sin is sin. Some people say, well, I'm too bad to get saved. I've been too big of a sinner to get saved. Some people would say, well, I, <clears throat> I was saved at an early age and I don't have a great testimony. Well, let me tell you, I was saved when I was six years old. Thankfully, the Lord spared me from a lot of nonsense. But even at six years old, my mom, who's at home watching today, if she was here, she would shout out a hearty amen. Even at six years old, I was still a little sinner. Did you know that? I know it's hard for you to believe, but I was pretty mischievous when I was six years old. I know it's hard for you to believe that about your pastor. Christy says it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. But no. I needed a Savior. Why? Because... I have missed the mark. We had a man saved two weeks ago in the first service. He was here today. He's in his late 60s. By his own testimony, he lived a long time not sure if Jesus even loved him because he had done so many bad things. He wasn't sure if he could get saved or not. Listen, friend, you're a sinner. It doesn't matter if you've got big sin or little sin. It doesn't matter if you've sinned a lot or sinned a little. We're all sinners. We've missed the bullseye. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And I want to tell you, there's no sin too great that God cannot save you. And there's no sin too little that God cannot save you. Some people say, well, I don't have that much of a testimony. I was saved at an early age. Listen, we forget that the miracle is, is that God still loves us and He has reached out His merciful hand and He has lifted us out of the miry clay and set our feet upon a solid rock. It's a miracle of God that any of us are saved. Do you know it? Sin. Sin. It, it, it means to miss the mark. We've fallen short of the glory of God. It, it, it means it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're never going to reach the mark of perfection. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It takes perfection to get to heaven. And guess what? None of us are perfect. Some people, it, I've been amazed that over the course of the years when I witness to somebody, typically I will ask this question. I'll ask them, do you mind if I ask you a spiritual question? If they say no, then I won't ask it. If they say yes, they're giving me permission to ask. If they say yes, here's the next question. In your personal opinion, what does it take for a person to go to heaven? People like to give their opinion about anything and everything, right? So in your personal opinion, what do you think it takes for a person to go to heaven? You'd be surprised at how many people say something like this. Well, I, I, I'm just thinking all the good's going to outweigh the bad. I've done more good things than I have bad things. And at the end, the scale is going to be, I'm hoping it'll be tilted toward all the good things that I have done. <clears throat> Friend, if that's what you're banking on to get to heaven, you're banking on the wrong thing because it takes perfection. It does not matter if you've done a thousand good things and one bad thing. When you commit one sin, we're guilty of all. When I commit a sin, I'm guilty of all of it. Therefore, all have sinned. I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark. 
and I've fallen short of the glory of God. No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard I train, no matter how much I Google and find out, how do I jump far enough to reach the goal? How do I train myself to do that? And I'm going to follow all these rules. It does not matter because we're never going to we're always going to fall short of the mark of perfection, the glory of God. You see, sin is a great gospel word because it reminds us of our need for a Savior. Did you know that you can't get saved if you don't think you need a Savior? You can't get saved if you don't think there's anything to be saved from. And Paul tells us that we're all sinners. That's why we need a Savior. That's the first thing. Sin. It's a great gospel word because it helps us to recognize our need. The second great gospel word I want to show you today is righteousness. Righteousness. We find it four times in verses 21 through 26. In verse 21, the righteousness of God has been manifested. In verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Verse 25, uh, uh, this was to demonstrate His righteousness. Verse 26, for the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness. Righteousness. That's a great gospel word. Sin, we miss the mark. If we were throwing darts, we're never going to hit the bullseye. We're never going to be perfect. If we're running a, a, a race, a high jump, we're never going to get to the line of perfection. We're always going to fall short. We're sinners. But thank God for righteousness. Righteousness. It takes perfection to get to heaven. We cannot save ourselves. But God will save us by giving us a perfect righteousness. Now you got your Bible. You might have to turn the page. I have to turn the page. You might not. In Romans chapter 4. Would you just turn the page? Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. The Bible says this. For what... Does the scripture say? <clears throat> Can I just pause right there? That is a great question to ask. It's a wonderful question to ask. In a day when everybody wants to give their opinion, when everybody's got an idea about this and that and the other, when everybody has got their opinion about what we ought to do about this, and what we all do about that. When everybody's trying to teach that there are many ways to heaven, here's the question that ought to be asked. What does the Bible say? What does the Scripture say? Well, Alan, I, I believe all roads lead to heaven. You've got your road, I've got my road, so-and-so got their road, and we're all going to meet in heaven. Friend, that sounds good, that sounds good, but it's not Bible. The Scripture says in John 14, 6, Jesus Himself says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Friend, Jesus is the only way to heaven. What does the Scripture say? That's a great question to ask. So, in light of this idea of faith and righteousness and being a sinner what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness <clears throat> you see righteousness was put on Abraham's account Abraham Abraham um, had unrighteousness and righteousness was put into his account. The word credited, uh, I think the King James Version said impute, imputed. 
It was credited to Abraham's account. What Abraham? Why, why does Paul talk to this guy who's been dead a long time named Abraham? Why does he even bring him up? Because Abraham was held in high esteem by the Jews. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, guys, if Abraham, whom we consider the father of our faith, we hold in high esteem, he, he is the man in our eyes. If he was unrighteous, I'm certainly unrighteous. If he needed the righteousness of God credited to his account, boy, I certainly need the righteousness of God credited to my account. You see, my spiritual bank account is empty. It does not mean I have a little money in it. It means I, I am empty. It's empty. Zero. Nada. Nothing. Zilch. There's nothing in my spiritual bank account. I have nothing. But, but, God puts His righteousness in my bank account when I come to Him and say, I cannot save myself. I need a Savior. Friend, when you got saved, when you got saved, you didn't bring anything to Jesus. Well, Jesus, I'm coming to you because I, I'm an influential person. I've got a great personality. I've got a wonderful business mind. I, I, I can do things with my hands. I'm bringing to you everything I've got. And uh, listen, I, I'm a pretty good fella. I'm a pretty good lady. I can do this. I can talk to this. I, I'm bringing you all my good stuff. No. The, the hymn writer says it this way. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Listen, friend, there's nothing that you nor I can bring to Jesus except our heart. We need the righteousness of God. Now, I'm just going to tell you, because I want you to hang in here with me. This is it. We're not going to cover any more points today. But I want you to listen to this. When you get saved, God puts His righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus into my account. The righteousness of Jesus is pure. He has never sinned, nor will Jesus ever sin. He has not fallen, nor will He ever fall. So listen to me. Listen to me. When God looks at me before I got saved, he looked at me as a sinner. Someone who has missed the mark. Someone who has fallen short of the goal. Of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Perfection. That's how He sees me. However, when I can say, God puts the righteousness of Jesus into my life. And guess what? When God looks at me now, even though I still sin, even though from time to time I still miss the mark, even though from time to time I fall short of the glory of God, do you know what God sees? He doesn't see my unrighteousness. He sees the righteousness of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And through His perfection, I've been made perfect and sees the righteousness of Jesus. He put Jesus' righteousness into my spiritual bank account. So guess what? You're as righteous as Jesus is. Did you know that? You've got the righteousness of Jesus. Now, we still deal with this old flesh. We still deal with flesh. And we still got to come to God. 1 John 1, 9. <clears throat> uh, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins <laughs> and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know who He's writing that to? Believers. 
people who have been declared righteous. But at the same time, when we sin, there's unrighteousness. But when we confess our sin, you know what God sees? The righteousness of Jesus. Boy, it's been deposited into my spiritual bank account. Alan, I don't understand that. I'm going to give you some good news today. I don't understand it all either. Did you know that? <clears throat> There's a lot of things I don't understand, but I believe. I put my faith in. I, 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 we, we're, we're streaming today, so I'm not going to do it. But if I were to go over here and to flip that switch, not the, not the overhead light, not the stage lights, but the overhead lights, they would go off. When I flipped the switch on, they would come on. Let me tell you, I don't understand that. I don't understand all the electrical wires and how all that comes together. I don't get it. But I'm not going to sit in the dark, are you? I'm going to cut this. I'm going to flip the switch. When you came in this morning, I promise you, there's not one person in this room that looked at the chair. Let me make sure this is going to hold me up that it won't fall. Let me make sure all the screws are in place. No. When you came in, you just went plop, and there you are. We, we exhibit faith every day, right? We, we display faith every day. But some people say, I don't understand all this, so therefore I'm not going to trust Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you, we've all missed the mark. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. And we cannot save ourselves. We need a righteous Savior. And that righteous Savior is none other than Jesus Christ. And when you invite Him into your life, God sees beyond my sin. And He sees the righteousness of Jesus that's been applied to my heart. <clears throat> I don't know if I fully explained it well, but I can tell you, since I was six years old, I've been a satisfied customer. <laughs> I've been a satisfied... And there's no regrets that I've given my life to Jesus. And I've never met anybody on their deathbed. Never. Not one time in 37 years of ministry have I ever heard somebody say, Alan, oh, I wish I would have just waited Till yesterday to get saved. I regret getting saved at an early age. I, I, you know, just as serving God, being a Christian, it didn't do much for me. I've never heard it, but I've heard a lot of people say this. Alan, boy, I wish I'd have got saved earlier in life. Boy, I, I could have avoided a lot of things in my life. I would just ask things to come into my heart. I want to tell you, friend, I want to tell you, I've been asked this week several times, is Jesus coming back? Yes, He is. When's He coming back? I don't know. But I know this, we're one day closer than we were yesterday. Did you know that? And I'm telling you, we, we, I'm just telling you, boy, I'm chasing a rabbit here. I need to close. Jesus says in Matthew 24, when you see these things start happening, they're the beginning of birth pains. Now, thank God He designed it that ladies have babies. Because us men are sissies. We couldn't handle it, right? Thank God. He, God knows what He's doing. But I do know this. I, I don't know much. Dr. Mitchell's here. He could tell us about the living. But I do know this, Doc. The more the birth pains, the more rapid they get, and the more intensified they get, you better get to see Dr. Mitchell because you're getting ready to have a baby. I'm just telling you, the more rapid things get and the more they intensify, listen, don't look down discouraged. Oh, it's the end of the world. What are we going to do? Don't look around fretting. Oh, Lord, have mercy. What are we going to do? I'm telling you, look up. 
Lift up your head for your redemption drawing nigh. I just want to ask you, can you look up with confidence and say, Jesus, anytime, anytime you won't come back is good with me, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. But the Bible says it's appointed unto man. Once to die. After this, the judgment. I'm praying I go by way of rapture. That's what I'm praying. But if I don't go by way of rapture, when I draw my last breath here, I'm certain I'll take my first breath in heaven. Not because I didn't do a lot of bad things. It's because as a six-year-old boy, I didn't know everything, but I knew enough to know I was a sinner. I knew enough that, to know that I needed a Savior. And I called out to Him to come into my heart and life and save me. Friend, it doesn't matter if you're six or 60. It doesn't matter. If you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart, don't leave here today. That, that's God telling you, you need to get saved today. You're a sinner, but you can receive the righteousness of Christ. Would you bow your head? I just want to help you talk to God for a moment. If, <clears throat> if you want to be saved today, you realize you're a sinner, and you realize you can't save yourself, you can't do enough good things to get to heaven, you've got to have a perfect Savior who credits righteousness to your spiritual account. I just want to help you talk to God. These words are not magical, but you might want to say something like this. Just silently where you're at. Say something like this, dear Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. Tell him that. I know I'm a sinner. I've broken your law. I need a Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you that you rose from the dead. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sin. I'm sorry. And Jesus, I want to live for you the rest of my life. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Friend, if you prayed a prayer like that and you really meant it, I'm telling you, Jesus has just come into your heart. You've just been birthed into the family of God. You've become a child of the King. And the Bible says that heaven's rejoicing, heaven's throwing a party for you. For you. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says when you get saved, you ought to let somebody know about it. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As soon as we stand and start singing, I'm going to ask you to do something pretty bold. But I'm telling you, it, it's going to mean something to you. This is the safest place where you can be. You, I want you to step out and you come and say, Brother Allen, I just got saved. I'm not going to ask you to speak. I'm not going to ask you to share your life history. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to have a seat. We're going to get your name and information so I can follow up with you. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand right here beside you. And I'm going to tell the church family, this is my new brother or sister in Christ. They just got saved today. And man, we're going to get in on the party that's going on in heaven. Would you be willing to do that today? Perhaps you've been visiting and you feel like this is the church where you ought to join. I invite you to come. Also, last week we had almost 150 people turn in uh, Loving God, Loving Others Day sheets. 14 different projects around our county, around our city. This Saturday, October the 21st, I want to encourage you, if you've not done so, to put your name, your phone number at the top and just check a project that you would like to participate in. Just one. Just one project. And at night, and when we start singing, would you count some have already turned in sheets here at this altar that didn't turn it in last week? Just, just come to this altar. Just lay it down as a symbol of saying, God, use me this coming Saturday to be a blessing to our community. Just bring your sheets down.
Perhaps some of you need prayer. I invite you to come. Some of you have been saved. Uh, and it's time that you come. So we can just share this information with the church. And let us get in on the rejoicing. Lord, move during this time. Help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. You come as we sing. You come. See if you have any questions you want to ask. It is not committing you to join. All right? We're not going to twist your arm. We're not signing you up right then. But if you just want more information, if you have any questions, you can come. And uh, you can get that information. Ask anything you want to ask. That's next Sunday. And then don't forget our Loving God, Loving Others Day this Saturday. We're all going to meet right in here at 9 o'clock. And then we'll disperse and go and uh, do some projects <coughs> around our community. Hey, I've got some good news for you. You want to introduce these students? You want me to? All right. And then when you get through, I'll introduce someone, okay? Let me get you. Over the, the last...
several weeks, we've had several students that have uh, made decisions, and uh, we finally got them all down together this morning, and uh, they wanted to let you know that um, they had made decisions to accept Christ, and uh, we want to follow up with them about baptism and their families and things like that. So, um, y'all just all come on up here. I'll, nobody's got to stand up by themselves at that point. <laughs> Um, we've got um, Braden Snodgrass here. Um, I know some of his family, and uh, they they got a special place in my heart. But uh, Braden, a couple weeks ago, uh, said that he had prayed and accepted Christ, and uh, we're going to follow up with him. And, and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to uh, do a baptism. And then uh, we've got Maggie. Uh, Maggie Young, she's here. She's got some family with her today. And um, several weeks ago, she uh, prayed, and we've been talking back and forth. And um, so uh, we're going to continue uh, to to work with her and, and um, just pray with her and just lead her. Uh, and then we've got Jaden Qualls on the end down there. Uh, Brandy had the privilege of uh, meeting with Jaden and um, uh, Addison. To a couple weeks ago, last week, and um, that they had indicated uh, a couple weeks ago or last week that um, they had prayed, and, and Brandy went to their house and prayed with them. Uh, and so, uh, Jaden and then Addison there uh, last week they they prayed and accepted Christ. So we're going to follow up, and then we're going to uh, do a baptism in a couple weeks. All right. I uh, want to introduce you to my buddy Caleb Smith. And uh, uh, Caleb texted me this week and said, "Listen, uh, I've been uh, the Lord's been dealing with me, and I don't have a personal relationship with Him. And I prayed and called out to Jesus. We were able to have uh, dinner together last night." And Caleb's uh, following the Lord and wants to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. He got saved this week. God's doing some good things in his life. And I am so proud of Caleb. And let's just thank the Lord. Okay? Yeah, it's been a good day in the house of the Lord. And so... Uh, Guess what? We get to do it again next Sunday, but we'll meet Wednesday night uh, for our different classes. Saturday, Loving God, Loving Others Day. If you want to fill out a sheet, put it right here, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you. Hey, guess, if you filled out that card, my wife and I are going to be under the TV in the foyer. If you'll give us that card, we want to give you a gift and just tell you thank you for being here. I love you. It's a joy to be your pastor. What? Okay.